So it's essentially to open it back up. Oh. <laughs> to open back, open up the discussion. We've essentially uh, agreed that uh, identification and labeling at the wholesale level is not necessary for this commission to look into. I'll just do a little bit of a recap while I'm showing the trivia. And that labeling should be, I'm just paraphrasing, but labeling should be required if the product with an RRD leaves the store. In essence. Is that correct? That was the consensus. <coughs> now then obviously we're going to have a difference of opinion as to how that should be written. And I think we're probably going to have extremes as to how that should be written. And I'd like uh, a couple of people from each side of the screen who will promise me that they will write something up, some sample language that will be not greater than about two to three sentences at the most to describe just exactly this process that would be used for a basis. And on the extremes, we have the retail people, and I'd like a couple of people to volunteer from the retail end to provide us with sample language. And we have the consumer end, and I'd like the consumer end to also write a couple of sample bits of language, submit it to Pam, please, within a couple of weeks, <clears throat> so that we can all look at it and start seeing if we can't come to some kind of a consensus or agreement on some sample language, so that if we're all happy with that, would be and Representative Kirk were happy with that, we could then take it to the at least the Senate, if not, uh, we won't be able to take it to the House, but at least take it to the Senate and see if we can incorporate that. Is that, a, is that an acceptable time frame or process? Yeah, I, the question I have is... I'll volunteer. Okay, <laughs> yeah, but you've got to promise to send me something. This time. I will. Uh -huh. My question, Mr. Chairman, Richard, is first. Um, the, the few sentences that you want, you want further concepts or what would actually look like legislative or statutory language? I think what would almost look like legislative. You could do either, but you can almost imply those concepts if, if you wish in the language, and then we can discuss them. Okay. Or we can talk about the concepts now, if you'd like. No, I don't think that's necessary. I guess we might, I don't know what it's going to look like, um, but mm -hmm. my concern is if, we're, if, if the request is to put it into statutory structure, it may be more than two or three cents. No, I don't mean referencing it. To this or that or the other. I'm just talking about right. two, two or three or four sentences in sort of what we call the intent. legislative mm -hmm. ease. Yeah. Le you know, legislative ease. Yeah, as, as right, well. and I would still suggest it may, I'm not saying it will, it may be more than two or three sentences. Economy of language is a gift. Understood. <laughs> I learned that in my early years as a law. <laughs> okay, okay, we have like to work on the consumer side. Sure. Okay, so Mr. Grimley, Representative Grimley. Grimley. Yeah. Who else would like to work on the consumer? <laughs> on the consumer. You're not on the commission, but you'll assist Representative Greenlee. And uh, Mr. Schultz, would you like to do that? Not really, because I was in the middle of still the other one. Was. Okay, and what are you going to do? You're going to get that finished? And what's that you're going to finish? We're working on the, um, I'll describe simply as the logging and the um, historical information assistance key. Okay, good. Okay. So then if we have Representative Kirk assist uh, Mr. Grimley, that would be sufficient. Yeah. We'll get Is that all right? Okay. Yes, sir, you had your hand raised. Okay. Do you want to discuss now the nuances behind this you were talking about? I'm going on. Who do sure we have on this? Again, no. Bob, Bob Grimley and uh, Grimley, Representative Kirk, Kirk. just the right. three of them? No, just the two of them, actually. Uh, Mr. Barnes said he wanted to be he's, on that. He's, <coughs> he's for the consumer. Mr. Barnes, you're going to well, have to well, well, I thought we were going to get opposite, uh, yeah. opposing yeah. sides yeah. here, too. Yeah. 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 So, Grimley and Kirk are working from the consumer side and from the... Uh, I'd be very happy to work on that. I'd be happy to work with um, Mr. Grimley and okay. anyone else. Yeah, I mean, she's, Barnes. she's from yeah, the consumer Barnes. side? No, but if I would you have... I would that you from the retailer or from the... That's right. Okay, so Ms. Glory and you, Mr. Barnes, will 
sort of present what we call a, a, a retailer an industry notion of how the language sounds. And hopefully we'll arrive at some kind of synthesis. How's that sound? That sounds great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, excuse me, but I think this making reference to sides is not necessarily a productive uh, approach. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I, I, think if, I think if there's a group, I frankly think there should be one group, and I think that that group should come to a consensus as to what they could find to be the language, rather than starting out on either side. <coughs> Again, I, 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 I just, it just seems to me that we, we go through this process and, and uh, I, I don't know that we have to be in, in, in the middle of this uh, two sides situation constantly. I mean, well, I'm not sure that. I, I, my, my personal voice is that the, the first concept will be far more production, productive than next editions. Maybe a step one, step two. Oh, yeah. We're, we're going to all do step two. Yeah. No, I just get the represented on the oh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just you might find that there's a lot more consensus than you might think um, between the consumer advocates and the industry advocates. Right. And by getting them to those positions yeah. in writing, um, they may match up. They may match up. Right. Right. Keep them separate and then bring them together. Yeah, I, went, I, I represented, I wasn't looking at this from an adversarial point of view. It's just that you have it's two very distinct mm -hmm. viewpoints. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And if they basically look at these and put them together, we look at these two viewpoints and they're relatively similar, they probably get it up pretty quickly. As long as they're relatively similar, mm -hmm. they might, that might happen. I'm sure they will be after a discussion today. <laughs> <laughs> now we want to get into, do we want to get into the nuance behind this? Because there were some, well, I mean, we're here now and let's, you know. Not, there are probably good reasons to do that and probably good reasons to not do that. Mm -hmm. I, I might suggest that if, if uh, there are other things that we could talk about that would be more productive, maybe we do that. Otherwise, let's do it. Sorry, I didn't get... What, what I was saying, are there other items here that we think we might make... Okay, okay this, is, this is Bob Perdis. I, I was saying, I, are there other items that we might be able to tackle more expeditiously today in the time we have left, or should we get into it now? With, with the nuances, it's, that's all I'm saying. Let's move on. If, if we, if we uh, are going to engage in a discussion where in two hours we haven't arrived at, at any day, where we could have dispatched with some other issues. You want to take a notification? I'm just throwing that out. If, what, what do people think? I don't mind get. I don't mind banging it out. Essentially, what you're suggesting is until we get this language, it's almost moot to discuss. Well, I'm not. I'm not necessarily suggesting that. All on the other, um, that is one point. But the other side of that coin is it might inform. It might inform the uh, the writing of the language too. So, all I'm saying is, if the group thinks the discussion will be helpful, let's have it. However, if we think it's going to be contentious and we will get nowhere mm -hmm. in the time we have left, maybe we should be something. I would. I, I would suggest that without further discussion. Outside of this setting, mm -hmm. for lack of a better term, on my end of things, mm -hmm. it will be contentious. <laughs> I know this one. Who does all the items here that are non-contentious? Yes, or anything. So that's another point too. Representative Kerr. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I heard this morning what I thought were some very positive sounds with respect to banning reading others' tags banning tracking in general, and um, perhaps those would be areas which could be um, the basis for some fruitful dialogue. Okay, on the list that we had in the agenda, we have consumer notification deactivation, which is almost a subset of this in a sense. Uh, with the pro prohibitions on the use of tracking devices, and that was relative to rental cars. Uh, restrictions on state use, I think, almost touches on this by virtue of the fact that we're talking about non-retail usages like in libraries and hospitals and things like that. That might be subject to concern. Do you want to <clears throat> maybe look at consumer notification then? Because this is going to do something. All right, would that be right? Hmm? I think I. Oh, yeah. 
having having proposed it, I just want to make sure everybody agrees. If people agree, we should talk about this language now. We should do it. But if you know, I think it's fine to move on if you want. What's um, the, what's the goal of body? Would you like to move on? Yeah. Raise your hand. The reason for not continuing this discussion, Curtis is right. I think people need to talk and think about this amongst themselves okay. to try to develop a position. And I'm concerned that this further discussion of notification, deactivation, and so forth, I, I think is tangential <laughs> to this. And that would not be as profitable an area to, to discuss at this time. I'd love to find some other areas where we might be able to reach consensus so we can feel like we really did something today. <laughs> I think we got a consensus that... So far, absolutely, and I, I, I'm, I'm feeling good about this. This is a long, long day, right. and I, I think we'd all like to leave on a high note. Well, we want some other things to right. on. Okay, well, we, like so low -hanging fruits. we have agreed on, we have agreed on mm -hmm. the fact that wholesale is not under consideration, and we've agreed that we, some form of labeling does need to be addressed. Okay, correct. So let's open the floor then to what other aspects do you think we want to deal with? I'm willing to entertain any of them. Elizabeth also has pointed out you know, the, the uses after you know, what, what can go wrong and let's make sure that that's included either in our existing law or in our future. Who wants to open that? you want to open that up, Ms. Board? Where I would go is um, what sort of, I would say, is no discussion going to go beyond just the retail sector consumer product goods? Is it going to go to all the other applications of RFID? That's where I would go. I'm not sure what um, Dr. Albright was referring to and where she thought I wanted to go. Sorry. <laughs> 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 Mr. Varn, I saw you raise your hand. Uh, well, I. Is that the, you're kind of exploring what I hear is the you know what productive use you can make of your time in the next uh, block of time is that is that right and then whether or not we want to and what we could maybe do in the next what hour? Well, hour, hour and a half. What what are the other concerns? You know, I really think that that if we can reach some kind of consensus on those other things that we discussed in the past. I, I agree, and I I guess I uh, um, I thought we had as you said we had. Uh, almost unanimous agreement as to how to deal with a general ban on tracking, as Representative Kirk said. <coughs> need language to do that, and if the study group that's been assigned that needs a, a little help, or we need to just make sure that they, they, they can bring that back to us, then that would be helpful. We could get going on that. If we need to give any additional direction on that, uh, that would be good. And also the group on the incidental reading, that we were going to give an exception for incidental reading as long as the information is not used or kept, we have some California language that is now working its way through there. It's being worked very hard there that deals with that question. Yep. But there's, there are two topic areas that we have previously assigned were on previous agenda, and I thought we we're going to come up. So those would definitely give us some, some, uh, some opportunity to do work on those. But I, I guess on the, the parameters, I, I can certainly offer some of the ideas we have on the structure of notice if you want to go there, too, and what we think some of the principles of notice should be. All right, let's go ahead with that. We've, we've got two or three things. Let's just go ahead with the, that. Just the, the latter one or the, the first three? The latter one. Well, uh, on the incidental read language, the way California is dealing with it, I can start with that one if that be all right. I know that one off the top of my head. Yeah. Uh, what they said is, is very similar to what we were talking about, and that is that as long as the information is not, is, is not used or kept and is disposed of in a, in a prompt time frame, that, that it was acceptable for a, uh, an RFID reader to uh, accidentally or incidentally read someone else's uh, device. And I can't remember the name of the uh, our technology person on there who is, is concerned about Wi-Fi and how wireless routers might be affected by that. But that was really the only concern that we had between that kind of general language and um, and full agreement was that one concern about we might be overly prescriptive because they do have to keep and use that data in certain ways when they're dealing with wireless access for Wi-Fi. But for retail uses, we really didn't have any disagreement. Okay, I'd like to address that. Well, I'm sure he's referring to um, yeah, credentials. 
it, it wasn't just Wi-Fi. It was more like we keep saying um, that this conversation probably shouldn't be so um, prescriptive to just RFID the way we understand it today because you never know how it's going to be tomorrow. <laughs> if we could say that, then I would say never mind any of my arguments because Wi-Fi is different than RFID. But based on already some of the other comments I made today and things that Dr. Albrecht brought, it's changing so much so rapidly. We really should stay in that broad scope. And, and while today an RFID chip is an RFID chip, well, yesterday it was non-rewritable. Now they're rewritable. Well, reasonably to say in two or three years, maybe this RFID as a concept, not as a technology, will then be using what's today we know as standard Wi-Fi on our laptops, maybe then used to for RFID. Because they said things get so much smaller and so, uh, um, more practical to do that with. So because of how much is changing, I think we should keep in mind all the different ways that this stuff. Uh, I don't think we should be thinking about all the different ways, but understand and accept that there's so many different permutations that this can happen, we shouldn't be overly prescriptive. And therefore, yes, um, when I look at technology as a whole, there's just so many things going on behind the scenes under the covers that I can tell you that you know, when I go back to my office tomorrow and I think about how much, I don't want to say information, but data, ones and zeros, numbers, stuck in a system somewhere that I can just go query and find, there's a lot of information I can find out about a lot of people if I really took the time to dig under the covers about everybody in my organization. It's the nature of the way these systems work. Um, and if you sit at home and go to a website, there's a record of what website you went to. Do they know it's you? No. Do they know why you went there or how long you were there? Probably not. You know, you can tell your ISP to stop saving. This goes back to what um, Google and AOL, we just heard in the news about you know, them having to give all the records or not. Yes, it's a problem, and yes, I think it should be people's privacy and within the organizations and things like that, but then where do you draw the line? Do you say, let's potentially hinder how the technology is going to progress by saying it can't do this, it can't do this, it can't do this? Or like me and my staff, typically what we deal with is people's problems. Well, you come to me with a problem and I say, sorry, I've been flushing your records every hour on the hour for the last six months. Let's start troubleshooting your problem now. Now they can't do their job for a week until we get more good data. That's one of the first things my staff says to me, says, you know, Greg, if we don't keep track of some of this, it's going to take us forever to fix anybody's problems. And, so this, and, and while I'm not saying let's keep this water bottle was bought by Elizabeth on this day, this time, whatever, it, there's, it's got this gray area and a happy medium we need to, I guess, discuss and find. It, it can't just be don't say them. It, it's got to be a little, it's going to be more complicated than that. I'm so glad to hear that it's going to be more one of the documents that Greg and I have been working through uh, is the work of Victor Mayer Schoenberger, who is with the John F. Kennedy School of Government. Mm -hmm. And he's authored a document here that uses um, Lawrence, Lawrence Lessig's um, concept of data forgetting. And so there is actually a team, and they're trying to get in touch with them, which is one of the reasons we've had to get the way. Trying to get in touch with them to give them this specific problem and say, how would this approach and this solution resolve what we're looking at? And if the, the conceptually, they, they start off the article, and I'd be happy to make copies available to the commission, but they start off the article saying, you know, Google remembers every search query you've ever made, ever. Um, that, that's, that's a new concept for society, and that we should build in forgetfulness into systems in places where that protects privacy. And so there are actually computer science, scientists and experts trying to figure out how you make machines forget. So maybe Walmart would need to look and see whatever it needed to see, and when it saw that's not my tag, then it would have to forget that data. And that's a technical issue, and there are people working on it. So until we talk to them, I think it's going to be hard for us to kind of theoretically come up with a way to do it until we talk to the experts that are actually doing it. Or any generic retail. No. Any generic retail. Oh, you mean that a generic retailer would no, be able to No, I'm saying you reference it? Walmart. Oh, I'm just, sorry. <laughs> I okay. that. Well, I say that only because Walmart's the only retailer that I'm familiar with yeah. having our fitting readers at present. But yeah, any, any retailer, I'm sure. Let me offer a, a thought. <clears throat> I assume that Google, for example, um, identifies the computer by its <laughs> URL. IP it's called IP. Yeah, it's IP. the IP number. Yeah. Okay. So it's IP number. If I could, I don't know that. And I don't know if anybody's proven that they have, or just proven that search for, I want to know how to do this, has been done. Or did they actually tie that to an IP number? I don't know that. I don't know if anybody Let's does. assume okay. that, Google, okay. Okay. that Google does it to an IP number. Okay. It's my understanding that you can um, buy a service from a company called Anonymizer. Yes. And they, in effect, have a server 
which has an IP number, and when you use their service, their IP number becomes your IP number. So that Google only knows that this server has requested this search. And the reason for mentioning this is, um, if it's possible for an individual on his own to protect his privacy in a reasonably inexpensive, realistic way, why do we need to put in a legislative solution? I think we're talking more about scenarios like organizations. I work for a public higher ed institution. I have, student, I have 2,800 students who live on my campus and use the facilities that I provide. I also have 1,200 staff and faculty members that use the facilities that I provide. Should they be considered private or not? And if so, there's all sorts of other things we're not going into. If anybody's heard about um, RIA and DMCA, we routinely get notices from this organization who's saying, this person is illegally sharing music. We need to know who they are. We get subpoenas for it. But do we save it or not? And that brings up a whole different can of worms, which is why I'm so concerned. In an organization, <coughs> is it possible for an individual computer to purchase this anonymizer service, therefore insulating himself from the situation? A student on my campus could prescribe to that particular one and use it and... And could a professor? <laughs> yes, but it's not going to completely hide what they do. It's like the idea of a phone tap. Where do you tap? If you tap in the room that my phone is connected to, it doesn't matter how much you try to hide, they're going to know it. So when law enforcement comes in and says to me, I want to see where this person is going, that's before the point of it being hidden, um, in some cases. So it still makes it very good. I'm just raising uh, yeah. another technological, a possible technological fix to the issue. And it may not work, as, as uh, you're suggesting. It would work definitely in some cases, and that goes back to the question of the you know, consumer with Time Warner at home versus an organization network like we have to run. You call Time Warner, they're not going to fix certain problems with it for you. Therefore, they don't have to track certain things and keep records of certain things. Um, same thing with anonymizer. My question would be, do they just throw everything away, literally, so that they can never be subpoenaed? Or could they be hacked, or could they be subpoenaed for the same information that we're trying to protect from? So I can't get subpoenaed from it anymore, but now they can. I, I don't know the answers to those questions. Because that's more the service that they provide. Um, but I didn't think subpoenas <laughs> question. I don't know. It, it seems to me like we're getting outside the purview of the commission. I mean, we're trying to uh, come up with legislation regarding RFID and not computer networks. So if we can find some way to limit the legislation to just RFID products or tags or whatever, RRD, RRD tags, whatever we're going to call it, but we need to bring it back down and, and, and just limit the legislation so we don't have to worry about what's happening with uh, big networks and things like that. I'll apologize, I was using as an analogy. I, I, I realize that analogy will probably work, but I agree uh, to bring it if back. If we can RRD. find a smaller subset of this that we can agree on uh, that fits into our purview, then, then I don't think we need to worry about all of the, the whole world. Right, right, right. Um, the concern is somebody with an RRD of any sort passes by a reader that belongs to anybody else it will most likely be probed, and if everything's working as it's supposed to, or it's following all the laws, it's going to see it's not mine, it's going to tick it in a log file somewhere that says, I saw this, and that's as far as it'll go. And, and we don't have to worry about uh, networking and keeping track of... Uh, not the other place. Right? Yeah. We, we don't have to worry about keeping track of individual computers or anything like that in this legislation. Representative Rimmel. What is the current topic? Since we've been <laughs> Incidental reading. Incidental reading. Consumer notification. No. No. Incidental reading of of tags <coughs> and, and what what happens to that information. Incidental implying accidental. Or accidental. By issue and what's the number of the best one? I have the California language if that would be helpful to help focus the discussion. Okay. Um, this is in a draft from Senate Bill three. 3-1 by Senator Semidian, who's been working on uh, RFID legislation of various kinds. And the exemption he put in 
was specific to contactless identification document system, but if we were to insert our own definition, that would be as restrictive as, as you suggested, Mr. Chairman, about maybe restricting it just to re, you know, goods sold at retail and the tags we were talking about before. It says a person or entity that is a course of operating its own contactless identification document system inadvertently reads or collects data from another contactless document identification system, provided that the following, provided that the inadvertently received data comports with all of the following. There are three components. A, the data is not disclosed to any other party. B, the data is not used for any purpose. And C, the data is not stored or is promptly destroyed. So if you take out the, the you know, their specific language on contactless identification <laughs> and put our definition of RD in there, these are exceptions to criminal statutes, et cetera, exceptions to prohibition. So a person or entity that, of course, operating its own remotely readable device system, inadvertently reads or as long as you don't disclose it, you don't use it, and you do not store it or you promptly destroy it, you would be exempt from being prosecuted for that. Working its way through SB 31 right now, and I, someone there might know what its status is who tracks that legislation. Could, uh, could you send us a copy of that? I thought we had that copy. Did we? We have something very similar, I know, that I wrote up that looks a lot like that. That's right. And it, and it is in the, the, the data we already have it before the committee, but they, they put this in a statutory format and they've been debating it, so I thought it might be more official if we use theirs. Well, if Dr. Albrecht wants to respond to that. I just have a question for you, Richard. How do they define what data is to be retained or is appropriate to read and what data gets discarded? Is there language for that in the bill? It was kind of hard to hear the board. I, I think you asked was how do they define uh, what data is to be retained or not? Right. Well, it, it, what it basically says is you, you, may not, you may not retain any data. The data has, it can't be disclosed, it can't be used, and it can't be stored or if it is stored, it has to be promptly destroyed. In other words, if there's a caching mechanism that temporarily holds the data until you determine it's not yours or it's not relevant to your system, as soon as they, you know, promptly, which, you know, promptly to me means not days, it probably means hours or a very small amount of time, you'd have to get rid of it. So there isn't any definition that lets data be collected. So it's basically <laughs> all data has to be destroyed, not used, and not disclosed. Well, but wait, you said data that's not relevant or doesn't pertain to their to their system. So what, which gives the implication that there's some information that's being used for some reason, otherwise they wouldn't be a reader. Right. Uh, the, the, what, what we had talked about earlier was saying that the data that's tied to tags, which your store still, which your store uses and you own, which have not been transferred to the, to the customer. In other words, once the customer owns it, no longer can use any data that comes from that tag because the customer has purchased that article of clothing, that item, and it's now their tag. And if we need to clear that up, I mean, that is something we have discussed as well. How do we know that, that the ownership will transfer? We can clear that up to say any RF, remotely readable device tag that's part of a, you know, that's attached to the device, once it's sold at retail, becomes the property <laughs> of the buyer or their successors in the sign. So once, it's trans once it passes past the cash register and leaves, then our discussions before said that it was, it was uh, actually to be uh, not read at all. So the only tags they can actually read are the ones they're still using in their store for their own purposes. Uh, that, that looks, this Mike Kalen, uh, that looks like that would be a problem because if a store wanted to keep track of serial numbers, for registration purposes, uh, or the big TV that goes out, or whatever, um, that looks like that serial number information is still property of the of the retailer. Well, it needs to be for personal use. I mean, that would that would seem to me to be a reasonable use of the uh, RFA, RFID tag after it's left the store. If they wanted to use that for um, identification if the product comes back into the store or if uh, um, they need to keep track of it for warranty purposes or something like that. Well, the, the data that's in that, on that tag is already, the store already has that data before they sell the tag. If, if the question comes up is can they read the
the tag later and then do something in response to knowing what's on that tag. We've been, we've, we've been consistent in saying we think it's illegal that they read it, and if they incidentally read it, we don't want them to be able to use it to be a marketing to us unless we give them permission to do so or to check a warranty. If I give them my tag back and I say, please read this, I want to return this, consent overcomes all of existing computer crimes law anyway. The data that's on that tag is already held by the store. We're not asking them to destroy the data when they transfer it over to you, just like we're not asking them to destroy any of their other sales records for any other purpose. They still know they sold that device, but they just can't read your tag when you come back in without your permission. Dr. Albrecht, and then uh, Greg, you're next. This, this sounds actually great, except for one problem, which is the, the reader devices and under this scenario would have to actually... Can you speak up a little bit, Kevin? I'm going to get a hard time hearing you. There's a microphone here. Can you hear me if I speak into the mic? Well, I can just barely hear you. I don't know where the phone is, but you sound phone. like you're far away from it. I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Is this That's better. Button? Thank you. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think the mic is not plugged in. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't pick up the phone. I think it's blasted out Richard's ears. I'm sorry for that. Um, <laughs> okay. So now the, the the problem that that I would see with that immediately would be that this this implies a couple of things. Number one, uh, that that items would have RFID tags in the store. And number two, that item that there would be RFID readers at the point of sale, which in regular people refer to as the cash register, because you would have to scan those items to take them out of the inventory and to make a record of the fact that those uh, had, had changed hands. Um, the concern I have with this is that uh, I have on pretty good authority that Walmart, uh, and th I'll bring them up specifically because I don't know much about other retailers. No, this is specifically Walmart. <laughs> Um, that Walmart has been working on finding ways to link even cash transactions with video footage of the individuals making the purchases, uh, potentially for use with facial recognition systems for law enforcement. So hang on, and, and where I'm trying to go with this is that, let's say I buy the pair of shoes and Walmart records that 803964 just got sold, then because there are lots of multiple cameras aiming on my face, then even if they don't retain that, someone with a warrant could go back and get that. I just want to point that out. That that's it, it's absolutely no. And, I know, I'm just, I'm just you trying to understand the concept. You have a conversation about what is capable, what what the, the retail industry is capable of, because they may not tell you. All this. <laughs> uh, the, the look on my face was not okay. disbelief. Okay. Which I'm trying it's, to understand it's, the it's concept. It's extraordinary <laughs> the, the amount of technology in retail spaces today to identify customers is mind blowing. And I'm not talking about you know your small mind paw in the corner of the local record store, but I'm talking about major chains who have spent huge sums of money to be able to get around the problem of not being able to identify individuals. So if that's caught in, on, on videotape, then you actually run that risk. So I have a problem be based on my research with the idea that RFID tags would be scanned at the point of sale. Great. Well, I guess I was just trying to restrict our conversation for now of within the range of what we've talked about, because we have not actually talked about whether or not, within the confines of our commission, whether or not the surveillance of consumers or of anybody inside an airport or a store or a government building and, and using any kind of technology to identify them, to re-identify them later, since it hasn't anything to do with RF technology, that technology in and of itself has kind of been pushing that out of the scope of our discussion. The linking of the RFID, just as I could link lots of technology to RFID, doesn't necessarily make it an RFID problem. I was just trying to strictly limit it to, all right, if we're going to be very strict about saying you cannot read these tags, if somebody incidentally reads a tag later, what do we do about that? And that was really all I was trying to fix with this language. That's all Senator Smithian was trying to fix with his, not the whole range of every ill that we can conceive that they might do. Yeah, correct. I, I don't doubt the... Um Scenario that Dr. Albrecht mentioned couldn't be possible, but I agree with um, Mr. Barn that it could be a barcode. If the systems are right, it's going to be taken at the same time that barcode goes across the direction. So, but it's an RFID. Put the picture with it. So, the picture to a particular product. So, it, it doesn't have to be RFID. And some ser some barcodes do have a serialized number. Some some products have two barcodes. One for the universal barcode serial number on the and the second one for serialized barcode for that exact one of that item type. Right. So I'm not saying the argument is invalid, just I don't think it's an RFID problem. Let's take this let's take this back to R D's then for the 
from the moment. Let's it keep it narrow. Um, uh, one of the thick, uh, objections I put to trying to purge this information is, again, we were talking, I can't remember who was saying about to, to know what to purge or what not to purge. That could be on a per piece of information basis. I mean, if I understand a certain amount of, okay, a transaction happens, you have all this information about the transaction. Should we get rid of some of the information from that transaction because it's not ours? Or should we eliminate the whole transaction <coughs> because it's not ours? And that's where I get worried about how easy that will be to do or not. The interim tariff idea and how it works to some extent. I, is there, and this is kind of a rhetorical question that maybe has the answer to be great, RFID chip says, I am part of lot number X. The manufacturer or the vendor then says, not ours, don't save anything. I would think that would technically be reasonably easy to implement and not save it. But if it doesn't have that in data network, you might call it preamble or, or non specific serial number, but let's say item type or, or retailer prefix. Uh, but if it doesn't have that, and every single one is just a completely serialized item that says this is the only one of these in the world, then there's no easy way for me to understand how a system can be programmed to, to just immediately ignore them without fully reading it and looking up to its own system that says whether or not it's mine. But if, once you've done that, you already now have a record of looking that up and it just becomes a, a catch-22 and a circular argument. If, if I could give one, one answer to that. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, the, um, the problem we were running into is the way the computer crimes are so strictly written, the act of irradiating the chip and having it announce its number. So if you have a system that's operating on the same frequency as that chip, producing RF radiation, which activates that chip and powers it and causes it to announce its number, that in and of itself is a violation of your Computer Crimes Act. So that's, it, it, since that is so strict, we were trying to avoid this trap for the unwary across a range of RFI, RF and other remote read applications, including door cards and in-store systems. So the very first part I was trying to address is just not criminalizing the act of having one turned on. So if you have a system turned on on the same frequency that the chip operates on, and you irradiate it, you're breaking the law if it announces its number because you've accessed it. Then the, the next step is whether or not you could filter those to not even, you can't really filter them to not query them because it's a dumb radiation system. It's not a smart irradiation system. It just operates on that frequency. And so the second step is whether you could filter, once it starts reporting its number, you could very quickly determine, well, that's no relevance to me. Anybody who's going to have these systems of radiating chips and collecting any data at all is going to have to, you know, other, they're going to need to have some structure of knowing what's relevant to them, otherwise there's no sense of having a system at all. Is, does that help? A, a bit. I think Representative Kalen had a comment. Yeah, I, I still have a problem, I think, with the fact that the store doesn't have a legal use, use to read the tag in their store once it's been sold to the consumer, because if the product is sold, and they purge their data and then that tag comes back into the store. How do they know whether it's their tag or not if, the, if that data has been purged? Well, I, I wasn't necessarily advocating they purge the data when they sell the tag. Right. Because that, that, I, that would cause the problem that you're raising. I'm just saying is, is if they later read the tag, they may not keep the data from that tag, which raises a lot of the concerns and erases, I hope, some of the concerns Catherine's been raising about people surreptitiously reading tags and and then connecting it to information and then using that in a way that's, that's inappropriate to the consumer. Even though we've identified it's illegal, we're taking that next step of trying to avoid making it illegal when it's, in, when it's, it's not happening, <laughs> when it's not actually being used for anything nefarious. It's just being irradiated and that's it. Doctor, you have a comment? Well, how do we feel about this? Well, it sounds like we're talking about a, a step two, and I, I don't frankly at this point know what our present laws say about the uh, you know, illegally uh, uh, accessing 
uh, RFID number. So once do we have on the books that that's illegal? To, do we already have the illegal question answered? I mean, now we're talking about access. Yeah, we're, we're hopefully going to adopt that. It is in the current law as well. Yeah. We're going to make it even stronger. Okay, we're just, so we're not talking about we're just talking about strengthening or defining. Yeah. Yeah. Colonel, I'm kind of probably answer my own question here while I was thinking about it. Essentially, what you're yeah. what just sure. talking about is some unbeknown frequency uh, or, or something radiating that's going to activate that RFID, correct? Yeah, if it's on the same frequency and it's, it's transmitting, it will activate the RFID. Right, so you could be walking by, I mean, I'm just going to throw out some electronic device. You walk by a TV set and it radiates the RFID chip. The question really is, is whether, who cares if it was radiated? It's really what we're caring about is if it, if it was red. So right, and stored, yeah. And stored. So the question is, is that, that you would actually have to be near a reader to actually pick up that signal once the uh, RF had radiated into the device, which really brings it down to either a place of point of sale or a place of point of return. Or an anti-theft location. Or an anti-theft location. Or someone who creates a reader for the purpose of tracking. That's right. Number four would be a person with intent, and we're only covering intent. Keep in mind the premise that we have here is this is already illegal. This is what, what we're writing is an ex exemption to the, uh, the illegality of it for people that aren't doing anything that we find offensive. And, you know, we want to craft that very narrowly and very carefully so we don't let unseemly activity or illegal activity in the door. And that's why I was trying to copy California's way over staff legislative, you know, group of drafters so they could, we could borrow from them. Right. Richard, um... This is Elizabeth. The reason I'm not commenting is that I know that that um, legislation that was drafted by Senator Smidian was uh, only for identity documents right. that are RFID enabled, and so I just don't have enough information on how something that was written for identity documents, which is obviously uh, very personal information, how that would impact in the retail environment. I, I just no, 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 what I will offer to do, Mr. Chair, is to put in the definitions that we've been using into the California language and make that available to the committee. Would you do that? And, and, and as soon as you do that, send it off to Pam Smarling. So I will, sir. All right, good. So she can send it to everybody. All right. I might feel reassured if there were also a restriction on where these readers could be placed. I mean, can Walmart put a reader uh, outside of my apartment building to tell if I'm carrying in stolen? Markets that haven't been removed from the inventory. I think it is important to say where the retailers put readers. Can they put them in the back room? Can they put them in outside the parking lot? Can they put them in the public park? Well, Mr. Chairman, um, in Europe now they sell cell phones that have a reader. So there's no need to demonize Walmart here. Anyone's going to be able to buy a reader in cell phone in the United States. There's not sold here yet, but I presume they will be eventually. So um, I think readers are going to be a lot more ubiquitous. Well, I would. And not just in the chance of the retailer. But I'm saying when a retailer deploys one, because they have specific knowledge and very sensitive knowledge about the items in their inventory that a random reader wouldn't. So I think that the retailer is in a unique position in terms of what their, their interaction with the reader. Why don't we take just the language that Mr. Barnes is going to present us and use that as a baseline to go from that point? Because in essence, it would seem to me that if you look at what we're doing in the amendment we're submitting, we're talking about specific, specifically about payment card scanning devices and re-encoders and things like that. We're talking about a potential use, but a use above and beyond what we consider the normal usage. Which Bank might might not do it. I'm thinking that that I got to say that Walmart wanted to put a. I don't need to use Walmart. A very large Thank you. Uh, uh, <laughs> retailer known to exist in the United States in other areas. If you were to use this and they were to place this in a manner that was not consistent with proper marketing, which would be on their premises, then they might be considered to be abusing right. their privilege. 
So I think what I like is I'd like to get the language, look at that, and then maybe we can expand upon that. You know, there'd be more than abuse, but I mean, I'm not disagreeing with you, Doctor. I'm just saying, let's look at it and let's go forward. Because it's not just Walmart. I think really what we're trying to do is hold harmless those people that, by virtue of the fact that they have a piece of machinery that kicks in another device that allows them to, to download some information inadvertently. We're trying to have a, essentially a blowout cause or a tripwire to say that we're not going to you know, nail everyone to the cross. And, and I think that's where essentially the car is going. What, what happens when my cell phone, um, I mean Accenture has a, a promotional piece that they did that says uh, the real world show and I like your sweater and I walk over and I get my cell phone at it and I get back information from your sweater how would, would, we, would the cell phone have to be programmed with forgetting software right in there along with your ID or your capability I guess you know you get you get into questions so well, is, see, that's is this, not well I guess what I'm trying to get to is this this specific to the retailers because I think they're, no, they're no. in a separate class I, I don't like the idea of strangers so no, it's, that's not. It, that's not an incidental reason. That would be breaking the law. That's right. 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 And that's what, that's, right. we definitely are not going to allow that. And we, it's not specific to retailers. Yeah. That what we're going what uh, the senator in California is writing and what I'll be submitting will be is if you're accidentally reading it because you have a device on, then you can't keep reusing the data. Right. You turned your cell phone on and said, "What a lovely sweater Elizabeth has." I guess that's right. that's what you're saying. Well, what you can do is, you have no intention of doing that, but we don't want to basically say that for some reason there's going to be scanner police who are going to come down and arrest you and take you away. What we have to do is really look at the fact that did you intentionally try and devise some kind of information from her as a result? So. Isn't that already in the language that we drafted? Yes. Because yeah. I own the chip that's in my sweater, although I would have clipped well, it off with all the hang tags. But if, it was, if I didn't put the tags on, even an EPC global tag, it would be <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I, it, I think we covered that in the language that we've already drafted. Or you could say, yeah, go ahead and scan my sweater. Well, I think just like voluntarily, sure. Well, what one point? Curtis yeah. and then Representative Taylor. Just to point out, under the, the last scenario about the apartment building and whatnot, you know, just placing a reader on someone else's property without their permission, a, is going to be illegal. Or in a public sidewalk, I would imagine you need the permission of the city council of the city of Concord, which I can't imagine that they would get. So it's not just big box retailer marching around and placing things wherever they want. I mean, that's absurd. <coughs> I, I'm glad you're pointing out that that's illegal. Representative Cameron. Uh, back to the sweater issue. Love if, sweater. If, you're, uh, great sweater. If, if your sweater identifies itself as uh, Macy's number two three five six, uh, which is a let's say a, a, a model number or whatever, as opposed to a serial number, would that be an invasion of your privacy? If it's mean a generic model, <laughs> a generic model number as opposed to serial number one two three four, which you bought on such and such a date at this store in that state in the United States. <coughs> Would, is, is there a difference there? Yeah. I think it's a You're, personal question. I mean, yeah. it's Some people would think yes. Sorry. <laughs> Some people think yes. In an earlier meeting, I, I way, way, way back when, I differentiated between two different privacy invasion models. One of those is the unique ID number, which identifies or could be linked up to identify me, so I can actually be seen walking through doorways, etc. The other one, though, is the guy sitting next to me on the airplane. You know, he, he, I think he's messing around with his Blackberry, but he's really pointing it at my travel bag to see what I had in there, and is then getting an inventory of everything I'm carrying. Even if he doesn't know my name, the fact that he now knows what's in my bag is, I believe, an invasion of my privacy. So in the case of a sweater, it's visible. You can kind of see it, but in the case of RFID, unfortunately, it doesn't just limit to what your eyes can see. It can look in your bag. Is that illegal? Presumably taking the tags off those items. Uh, oh, I well, just pass this around. <laughs> I got the evidence at lunchtime of the shoe tag. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is what um, Catherine said illegal under the language that the Commission has adopted? In other words, assuming that the airplane is over New Hampshire and governed by New Hampshire law for the moment, <laughs> um, if, if her seatmate tries to read the items in her purse or on her body, 
and the seatmate has no relationship with her, just a stranger, is that, and, and obviously no consent, is that illegal under the, um, the amendment that the Commission is proposing? Current law and proposal, both. Yes, thank you. Okay. And the other thing we can do is, uh, no, I won't, I won't go on with business. How do you want to proceed then with this? Any further comments? Dr. Um, I'd like for Mr. Schultz and I to go back, and, and I'm still trying, as I said, to contact Harvard and see if we can get a little more information on that. And maybe we can get together with Mr. Barnes and his one group and uh, come back to the next meeting with uh, this proposed language that hopefully we all do. Okay, I would like that. It's just that we're all, we always go away with great expectations yeah. that we're going to have proposed language and somehow we come back with not such a great end result as often as not no proposed language. So I'm hoping that we have these two conceptualizations of what constitutes label, an acceptable label, or provisions behind that. And we have this, and what else are we basically dealing with? And I'd really like to hit the ground running again and get some stuff into some hard letters so that we're really going to be dealing with issues. Because frankly, I don't want to keep coming back and conceptualizing and keep coming back and conceptualizing. So. I, I think Richard's language is a great starting place. I just would like to see the okay. technical feasibility of the forgetting part of it, which is actually, I think, important. Okay. Can you get that out, Richard, do you think? Uh, I can send his language immediately well, because there's really not that much that needs to be changed. We just need to take the definition we're going to use right. of remotely readable device and insert it in there. Why don't you do and that it today? Doesn't, it doesn't actually, the forgetting part, what it says, Catherine, is it has to be destroyed. Okay. So I think that's the part you want to look at. Exactly. And, and if you're, that's in a timely fashion or immediately? Or I'm going to send it to Pam right now. Okay, good. So everyone else will have it by tomorrow. Is that what you asked? I'm sorry. Yeah, you bet. Yes, please. Okay, sending now here. Okay. Any further on this issue? Do we want to go further? What else would we like? Do we want to represent? Would, would Dr. Albrecht want to consider using that language uh, to address <coughs> data forgetting or add your own kind of language? Relative I, I, to I data so like the language, and that actually works for me. So um, but the, uh, it raises another question for me, which is the differentiation of the data, which I'm not sure the California legislation actually clarifies. And it probably should, Richard, if you're working with them. Uh, you may want to point out to them that they, they need a clear definition of what can and cannot be read or retained. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, we're just taking a very small section of three, uh, Senate Bill 31, a <laughs> right. broad set of things that you cannot do. Right, that, it sounds like the government the documents, they, they are addressing that, Kathy, so take a look at it. Okay, it's super, perfect. So that, that may just resolve the problem with that. Okay. If, if there's a way to do it. Should we deal with language to rental cars, since we're somewhat in the... Yeah, here. I'm sorry, was that directed at me? Well, <laughs> no, this was directed at me. It was a lot of in its entirety. We have the paperwork in front of us, and I'm just trying to go down the shopping list to see what we can. Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, sir. Uh, Representative Kirk had two other areas that said we could work. We were working on that would work. I, I do, and I agree with you. If you're also suggesting that we really ought to wait till Marty is here before yeah. we deal with this issue. Okay. I mean, I have some language that I could put on the table on this issue, but. I think it'd be fruitless. But if you have some other issues... The, the other issues were the one that uh, Richard mentioned earlier, and that was ban reading of others' tags, which may be related to incidental reading. It is. And the other is to ban tracking in general. Which I think we have done, right? I don't think so. No. no we, we sort of touched on tracking, but part of the tracking is the rental car situation. And this is about the second or third time that we put off dealing with rental cars. And that's consistent with the fact that the person who's going to be the expert is supposed to be here each time. And pretty soon we're going to deal with rental cars where the person isn't here. I would agree. But, Mr. Chairman, I think you can, the Commission could profitably look at a ban on tracking and either in the definition of RRD mm -hmm. or as an exception to the general tracking language deal with the rental car. That's fine too. 
So I, I think it could be very profitable to look at a ban on tracking at this point without Mr. Honingberg being present. Yes. And then he can tag in, so hopefully he will be present at the same time. Tagging in, yes, of course. Right. Okay. Okay. How do we feel about tracking? And he doesn't have a chip on the shoulder. <laughs> okay, so how do we want to go approach that issue? What are we talking about? Is it, is it safe to say we're talking about scenarios where you're probably signing a fairly comprehensive contract? Rental car, cell phone, I'm even thinking maybe tool rental from a Home Depot or something where they yeah. decide RFID their chip so you sign something. Yeah. It's different than buying a bottle off the shelf in the store. If, if that's the case, then you might be simple. I would like to believe maybe simple enough to say, just the contract has to say that you know the thing you're walking out of here with has there are some chip in it that we can find it with, or maybe activate it if it's a law enforcement issue or something along those lines. So you're talking about a fair warning notification. That if there's just cause, we would then go look for our product by using this technology that's embedded in that device. That's what we've discussed in this before, so I, I don't disagree with it. Go ahead. Well, I think one of the things we talked about before, though, is, is it's not the default state that it's tracking you wherever where you go, but only if they're, you don't return it on time or they have a, a, a stolen item report or the police are involved or something. But at that point, they can activate it to get it back, but it's not automatically tracking you. I, think the scenario, I thought we all agreed on that. The scenario that came up is if you're not allowed to cross the state border and they're watching to see that you don't cross the state border. Because that may change the rental rate, for example, for insurance. Well, that's, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's where that was the classic example. Right. I'm not going to agree or disagree. I'm saying that was the, right. the catch that we kind of worry about for the rental card. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. May I read some issue was uh, for law enforcement. Sometimes they'll make inquiries because a, a rental car was spotted at the scene of a robbery, but it is not overdue and it is not suspected to be stolen. It's probably still in the possession of the person that rented it, but they used it to commit a crime. That might be tracked in that case. Uh, can, can I read the language we had before the commission right now? Do you, do you, would you, that be helpful, Mr. Uh, Jerry? Thank you. I'm sorry, what? Yes, please. Okay, it's what, we, what we submitted was uh, electronic tracking prohibited, mm -hmm. except as otherwise provided by law. No person may use a tracking device of any kind to track another person without a valid court order, a valid contract which clearly authorizes such tracking or the prior written consent of the person being tracked. That was the language we submitted back some months ago. And then we were gotten the objection to that it, it didn't allow for some of these other exceptions to be done. Mm -hmm. Law enforcement exceptions or when maybe the contract isn't completely clear and you think something you have is stolen and you want to find it. I mean, what you're saying is there's a certain tripwire in there for Representative Kirk. Uh, the problem with that is contracts of adhesion. When I go to buy something for Sears, I, it's on a take it or leave it basis. I don't negotiate with Sears as the conditions of the contract. Therefore, if you put this language in, his B clause with the except if it's allowed by contract, and effectively uh, neuters this because every retailer, every seller of goods who is concerned about this will simply put in the language, um, you hereby give me authority to track. Um, We've had this issue elsewhere, and obviously I would prefer a language that says, if that language is to be in there, no individual shall be offered an incentive, denied an opportunity, or in any way treated by a person differently from any other individual mm -hmm. as a consequence of withholding or providing such consent. In other words, you've got to have a quality here between the two parties, the seller and the buyer, or the, the renter and the, and the uh, lessor. If you just take Mr. Barnes' language, you lose that completely. Actually, we haven't, we haven't really disagreed about that, Representative Kirk. We're just trying to figure out how to draft that part and how we can, you know, define a contract of adhesion, and especially given an exemption for things that are actually designed to allow you to be tracked, and that's the service you're signing up for. So your contract actually asks for that, and maybe that's covered under written consent. It's but it might also just be a contract, such as a locator thing you take up in the mountains with you that tracks where you are in case you get lost, or the beacons that you use if you're caught in an avalanche. So those those rare exceptions, or I guess the OnStar system, which does track you by contract. It sure. treats you differently. And I don't know how to get around that. I just don't know how to draft it. it. It does kind of treat you differently because if you have an accident with OnStar, they actually know it, and 
they contact the police if you don't answer your phone. So you're technically being treated differently if you run a car with OnStar than you, you do without. And, and I agree with you, but I, I don't know how to write it, so we keep the reasonable exceptions in there and keep people from being forced to do something they don't really want to do, but they're just stuck with it, like having a cell phone for two years you don't like. I believe, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I believe that's already covered in the definition of consumer product. Um, okay. And this is on S1 Roman 2 on the first page of the various drafts that I've submitted. A consumer product is defined, and then it says, a consumer product does not include an identification document or any product to the extent that unique identification, and this might have to be modified, via radio waves is an essential part of the consumer's use, including but not limited to commercial mobile radio and so forth, easy pass, keys, and garage door openers. In other words, if the, if the, if the use of the electronic device, or the RRD as we're calling it, is an essential part of the operation of the product, then for our purposes, that is not considered an RRD. Well, but the, the problem I have with that is an RRD may not, I don't want an RRD, just because I have an RRD in my product is an essential part of the use, like a cell phone, I just still don't want to be tracked if I don't give permission. So we'd have to modify that definition in a way I just haven't figured out how yet, because you could have something, an RRD could be an essential part of the device, but it's still I don't want it to be used for tracking. No, it's not an essential part of the device. It's an essential part of the consumer's use. Well, then we have to say that tracking was the essential part of the consumer's use, and that might bridge those two. Do you know what I mean? The RID for use in tracking is an essential part of the consumer's use, and that's why they're buying the product. Would that work? Uh, I'm not, I have to think about that, but I think you're on the right track. <laughs> In other words, if, if you're buying a product where you agreed to be tracked, you want to be tracked, that's the purpose of the product. That's very different from buying a cell phone, the purpose of which is not to track you, exactly. but to enable you to communicate. And because the RFID chip in the telephone is necessary for you to use it, under this language, would mean that it is not a consumer product for the purpose of using it as a cell phone, but it would be a consumer product and therefore subject to the tracking ban if it were used to track you. Now that may be very subtle and we'd want to put that a little bit more distinctly, but I think the issue, or at least one method of dealing with the issue, uh, is to deal with the definition and distinguish between a product where the chip is essential to the use of the product and the reason why the consumer buys it. Let me take a stab at writing another of the enumerated exemptions here, and then take, because the language you read before, Representative Kirk, that's the standard language you had in there before related to the incorporation into a human body, right? No. Is it different than that? This is in the first section, definitions under consumer product. No, no, I mean the language you said that no person shall be treated differently. But that's that's my standard verbiage. I have a, a special key on my computer, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> and every time I write legislation, I press that key. Yeah, I... I uh, I, I was thinking if we could bundle those two things together into this section, we might go quite a way towards solving those concerns you have. Take a try at it. All right. And I, I still, though, I have never been sent the car rental language so that I know someone was supposed to have gotten it from the commission. I don't think I've received a copy of it. The California language? Yeah, was was sent, that sent around to all of us? It, it was sent out at some point. Yes, it was. <clears throat> but we did not send it yet. Who, who sent it out? It was passed out today. Just today. Okay, well, I'll, today. I'll send it to you right now. No, we'll send it to you right now. Okay, thank send you. I'll, I'll try to, I'll take a look at that and see if I can learn anything else from that. I'll be happy to take on the task of getting a draft for our next meeting. Well, you've got a lot of tasks. Why don't you review what tasks you're taking on so it'll be very clear to uh, What I was going to offer to do here was to put together Representative Kirk's two exemptions language. And, uh, and put that into a general ban on tracking. I'm not volunteering to try to, re to see if the California uh, rental car language would, would be appropriate for New Hampshire. I don't feel qualified to take that on. No, that's being sent out to you now. That, that we have in the house and unfortunately didn't get to you right away. But okay. Essentially what they say there is uh, Hertz is not advocating that New Hampshire adopt California provisions regulating the use of locating technology. 
Well, well, and you can read the rest. But stay. So, all right. Um, I wasn't going to make a point or an opinion. I just wanted to make an observation. Um, Representative Kirk was speaking about the very clearly stated the terms consumer product. I was wondering if either the commissioner or Mr. Barn, when he's working on it, would, um, if it would be prudent to consider the difference between a consumer product and some sort of lease or rental agreement. I think we've kind of already done that, but it might be more relevant or again relevant to this particular discussion about these contracts. You know, I own my cell phone, but I don't own my car. The rental tool that I'm buying, those aren't, I wouldn't consider those consumer products, maybe it's just a semantics thing. But. Did you get that, Mr. Barn? Yes, I, I do. I'll, uh, I'll see if that, that makes sense. I'll, I'll, I'll put it in two categories. And I, I really will need some assistance from our state police captain to uh, identify some language that would be relevant to what law enforcement is asked to do when there's a concern about the use of a rental or lease product in the commission of crime or in an investigation or for a missing person, et cetera. And why don't you, you want to put that, that stab at it, but you want to put that question to the colonel right now so we can respond to that? The answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> he just walked in. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, what, what, put the question again so that the colonel can... The, the question is, 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 is there any way we could write an exemption for law enforcement's uses of data from rental car companies and others uh, that, uh, that reflects uh, the way that police need to work when uh, a rental car, for example, is used in the commission of a robbery, and it's not stolen, the car is not stolen, but there's a need to find out if the, where the car is, and you can turn the tracking uh, item on in the car and find out where the car is, so you might apprehend the suspects who committed the robbery. Yeah, I think you'd want to do that with subpoena. You know, is it subpoena the records uh, of the rental company, or you'd have to go to the court and get a warrant? Do you want to go clear to the warrant requirement? Because I got the impression that sometimes they just cooperatively identified where their car was and helped you find them quickly. Is there probable cause? I think you'd want to have some probable cause to want to do that because otherwise you're going to have a uh, consumer saying you got no right to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking of from the standpoint that, if, for example, if you had the uh, commission of a crime that involved a... Uh, uh, armed robbery that turned into uh, to a basically a murder. You know, I don't know if you just want to go access that information without having a warrant going to the rental company saying, saying, um, you know, I need to track this. Well, I'll tell you how I think they get there now. I think with it's the standard Hertz contract, for example, you're not allowed to use their cars in the commission of crime. It's an automatic or a violation. So if a police officer brings uh, evidence that a car was used in the commission of a crime, let's say a hit and run, a robbery, something like that, then that gives, I think, Hertz now cause to act as an independent citizen to locate where their car is and then to ask the police to help in its return because it is, it is a, it, they're asking for help. I think that's the way they do it now. Can I ask a question of the colonel? For drill, maybe this is the other way. If there's a bank robbery going on and they see a license plate and they're able to run the number of the license plates and they determine that it belonged to Avis or Hertz, or one of the other major car rentals, like Thrifty, could they then go to Avis, Hertz, or Thrifty, or could they simultaneously get issued a rather quick warrant to get the information? Would they? Would, would, would you be limited by time or? or I mean, maybe limited by time because. Yeah. But I mean, my, my point being is, is that can you get a, get a warrant issued pretty rapidly from the court? Or is that sometimes you can and sometimes you hunt around. Hard to tell. Yeah, hard okay. To tell. So then the other question is, is you could go to Hertz in that instance and you say, we have reason to believe that this car was used in the commission of crime because of license number 12345, mm -hmm. and then they could be allowed to release that information to them based on the fact that they're stipulated in their contract. So. Is where's the problem? Well, I, I, I'm just thinking from a standpoint of, of evidence. Extra caution. Extra caution. And then part of the real issue is run that through the AG's office, see what they think. Would a post warrant be acceptable in that case? I mean, would a post warrant be acceptable in that case? After, after oh, the oh, oh, sure. Sure. 
So you could you be you could be covered in that sense if if we put it in as a post. Eventually, if you got a warrant. I just have one around this one as well. That's true. We're going to check on that with uh, the representative from the Attorney General's office. And we very well may be all right just under existing law. Well, part of the reason I put in there is except as otherwise provided by law. Mm -hmm. And also added in valid court order, I meant to catch anything that the law allows for the use of this exigency, uh, you know, national security, whatever reason that the law allows now plus warrant was what I was after. So if you could ask the Attorney General to see if they thought that those two components of the existing language that we offer to send documents to the commission had there, uh, if that covers these other provisions, that would be helpful to me too. Thank you. Greg, I understand yeah. something. Um, we're talking about rental cars because of the definition we kind of come up with of remotely readable device, right? yeah. outside of the art language concept. Yeah, right. remotely readable. That's a presumption. That and tracking in general, yeah, that, that is what they do, is they can track it electronically. Question again. I, I know, I've done this a lot, I'll, I'll do it again. I mean, another scenario where I'm not so sure um, I mean, the amount of time we're spending on, on this exact scenario because it's a remotely readable device that somehow uses RFID. Uh, example that I think we're not thinking about that would make all this conversation relevant for just outside of radio frequency is what they're doing in New York. Has anybody heard what they're doing in Manhattan with the tax in their uh, vehicles for certain times? How are they going to do that? Do they, do supposedly they can do it by, with a camera system that reads license plates. No RF, but they're remotely readable. We're talking about printing now. And supposedly some computer system will be able to interpret the numbers, run through the database and say, you shouldn't have been next, you didn't pay a tax, so we're going to levy a fine. That would be by operational law, then. But the point is, it's not RF, yet with a remotely readable device, i.e. a license plate. And yet, we're not considering how that will apply here, because we're stuck in RFID, but yet we're considering a rental car that's not RFID, it's uh, on a star satellite tracking system. Yes. I just feel like we're kind of... Mr. Chairman, um, Mr. Schultz, that's illegal in New Hampshire. Okay. We have a specific <laughs> statute that says the state cannot photograph highways or vehicles on highways in a way which would permit them to identify the vehicle, specifically license plates. Satisfied my concern. <laughs> Sometimes we get there first. Uh, I guess just a clarification, uh, Representative Kirk. Uh, what about the toll booth and Easy Pass? Uh, if you don't pay, they cannot. They the photographs on Easy Pass photographs are limited to the license plate only. We can't take pictures of the people. Okay. And they can use the information. They, that's a specific exception. They can get the information and use that to find the person, but they can't put an automatic scanning camera on the highways that would automatically look at every single license plate and say, beep, we finally, finally found the guy who was 25 cents short I see. on his EC Pass account. That's a shame. The Colonel's objection is logging out anyway. Okay, we're uh, behind you. Is it? Yeah. It's starting to snow. Yes. So I, I, I entertain a motion to adjourn prior to adjournment. That's right. I think we've covered quite a lot of stuff. And let's review what we have to do for next time. We're going to have to figure out what the next time is. Mr. Barry, if Mr. Barn can't be here, is going to be uh, unavoidably detained in the middle of February. February is going to be very difficult for the rest of us because we've got a lot of legislation and stuff to get out. Uh, we've been going into crossover period uh, the 13th of March. Uh, this bill probably, whatever comes out of Congress, won't be going to the Senate, I would suspect, until after the 13th of March. So we would be looking at potentially uh, dealing with it on the Senate side probably March into April. I think that's a safe assumption. You're shaking your head, Representative Kirk. I, I don't disagree with you, Mr. Chairman. I was hoping that uh, we were so excited by the 
progress that's been made today that we wouldn't want to let memory lapse. Some of us are getting a little long in the tooth. Not, <coughs> not if we get all our paperwork done. We just so that if we, I was just wondering if it would be possible to meet in two weeks. Uh, I frankly don't think it would be possible in two weeks. But personally, I can't meet in two weeks. If you want to run the commission, you're more than welcome. Well, we want you here, Mr. Chairman. That's right. Uh, personally, I can't. I'm going to be selfish and say I'm going to be down in New York City in two weeks. So. Three weeks. Three weeks. Uh, when's the, when's the, um, when's the uh, vacation time? 25th through the 29th? Yes. Yes. All right. Um, so, we're we looking. I'm always here. All right, you know what's <coughs> Uh, we looking at the end of March. Um, I would like to, if we have a crossover day, I'd certainly like to at least be by the middle of March if that'd be all right. Does that seem to Well, early part, we, we're still going to be wrapping up some legislative stuff. And I'm just, I've got to leave some room for legislation. I would ask for a Friday if possible. If that works for the legislative calendar. Mike, hold on though for a second, please. I just have a point of clarification. Are, are we, as a commission, in a position to be sharing information piecemeal with the, the folks in the House who are working on these issues so that their hands aren't tied waiting for us? Because there are some places in which we have reached agreement. It, it, would, it might be nice to maybe, so they're not sitting there waiting for our next meeting in six weeks or whenever that will be, so that they've at least got something to work with to know where we're all in agreement. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I thought we were going to be adding anything we agreed upon as an amendment as we went along, okay. so it always shows up in the, in the progress yeah. process. One thing that um, commission members should note, House Bill 686 is alive and well in the Commerce Committee. Mm -hmm. It's either been assigned to a subcommittee or it shortly will. And as was um, made very clear on the floor of the House when it was recommitted, the entire bill is before the committee, not just the amendment that this group is proposing. And it's very possible that that committee will take a look and come out with some things that this commission has discussed, has yet to discuss, because anything that's in the original 686 is on the table. So. I mention this to suggest that it's possible the Commission will be left hanging on some of these issues, which to me is a reason for meeting sooner, I'm sorry Curtis, sooner rather than later if, if the Commission is to weigh in on these issues. Otherwise, what people will argue at the meeting is, well, the Commission hasn't spoken, so let's not act on it. But there are some times when that's ignored. Well, we know that they're going to act on this. They'll, they will consider both the original 686 plus this proposal. Next Thursday, I believe. Next Thursday, I believe. Right. Right. Seventh. Right. Seventh. That would be available on the internet, mm -hmm. on the House website. Okay. The original. Amendments may not be available. Okay. If you wish to go in and make representations, uh, as an individual, and you feel that certain things are correct and fine, then go ahead. I'm not going to go in and make any representations on behalf of this commission until we agree to specific language. That's just exactly. It. If you wish to go in and say, "Well, we've discussed this and that and the other, and we're working towards an agreement," that's perfectly fine. But I can't, I can't in good conscience do anything other than what we actually agreed to further. I want to do this in such a manner that I think that it's going to be consistent and uniform. I think that if we allow a fair amount of time, because we really sort of jobbed off a bunch of stuff to a bunch of people that they really need to sit down, because they have other jobs and duties too, and work on this and in a timely fashion within the next two weeks get back to us so we can start digesting it, I could entertain towards the end of the month or the beginning of March having a commission meeting, which would be well in advance of any kind of Senate hearing. I could also ask the Senate to delay hearing this bill for a sufficient amount of time if it gets to the Senate in some kind of capacity, so that we can then introduce any language we thought. Bear in mind, we don't have to complete the report till the end of the summer. I just think that if we can get a lot of this stuff done with, we can wrap this thing up 
probably by this spring. So I, you know, I, I, I personally, I, I won't be here two weeks from now. I've got other stuff I've got to do. Uh, this next two to three weeks is going to be very difficult. We have uh, the 21st is the last day to report out all the final bills. I know my committee's got about 10 or 12 bills they're dealing with. Some of them are very tricky. We've, we've taken care of the bottle taxes, so they're out of the way. No, not yet. <laughs> no, no, no. We're not there yet. <laughs> but essentially what we've done, but essentially what we've got is we've got some very huge landfill issues. We've got some, in my committee, bills dealing with corn. I know Congress probably has quite a quite a few things. You have our, I know you have, they have the regional greenhouse gas. And issue. We've got a lot of work for the next two or three weeks. Would it, us, collectively. Would it be possible to meet on Friday the 22nd or Monday the 25th? Uh, Mr. Byron, we're like a Friday. Of February. 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 29th is vacation time, right? <coughs> uh, the legislative vacation starts on the 25th and runs through the 29th, plus the two weekends, one on each side. But that doesn't mean we can't meet. On Friday, the 22nd, before the vacation no. starts? If I might just add, I, I think the committee should be very pleased with the progress that we've had under uh, the chairman's leadership. I think we've actually accomplished a lot. We've had legislative language to give them, and a great deal has been done. But we had a slow start this year. There was also an historic election last year. And um, in the time that we've been meeting, I think a lot has been accomplished. We have language to give them. I'm, you know, I think they should be very impressed with, with what we've done today. And we need to be on a roll going forward. So I think that we should be in good shape for the uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to just add to that that um, I would agree, totally agree with that, that I think we all have been sincere in trying to move the, the, the ball forward and not no one's been stonewalling anything here. And I would hope that the legislative committee uh, that's going to be hearing the bill understands that, that we've, we've been doing our work diligent, we've been taking time away from our own personal jobs and, and certainly you from uh, other legislative issues to address this area. And that you know they'd, they'd allow us to complete our work without circumventing what we're doing. I mean, I think we'd be kind of offended by the fact that uh, we weren't able to complete what we were commissioned to do in the beginning. We'll, we'll carry that message forward. Appreciate that. I'm looking at potentially the week between the third and the seventh of March, which would be after the. I'm sorry, Kurt. No, yeah. Give him my best shot. Okay. I would, I would again ask for that Friday, the 7th would work well for me with the city council meets on the 6th, so the 7th would work better for me. If it works good for a legislative day. Mm -hmm. Friday would be fine. How's that for you? It's okay with me. All right. Okay. 10 o'clock? Is it Friday, 7th of March? 10 o'clock. Friday, March yeah. 7th. The reason I say that is I've got usually what's called a weekly or every two weekly dairy conference. And that's one of the Friday at 9 o'clock is when I have to do those, which I'll do right here and we're going to wrap up. Uh, okay, let's follow uh, what we're doing with on chores. Okay. Chores. All right, raise your hand and tell me what you're doing. Okay. Mr. May I state sure. the ones I have written down here? Yeah. Uh, Schultz, FCC notice for approval. Um, Clark, can Mrs. Notier, Ms. Notier follow up on the FCC question? We, no. So, no, no. Theory. So that, that's her responsibility? I asked the question, she's looking she, at it. That's right. <laughs> okay. Um, Finnesy consensus is that labeling is required. Can parties generate sample language that was passed to Grimley, Kirk, uh, Board, and Barn? We were going to have two consumer and industry groups. Well, well the idea of mine, this wasn't meant to be uh, hostile. It was meant to be, let's see what this idea is, and let's see what this idea is, and let's see independently how close they are after a discussion. Uh, I have Schultz still working on historical info kept by RFID tags. Have we settled that pretty much? Today? Thank you. No, that's what me um, yeah. afternoon and Richard is looking at. Okay. okay, and Mr. Barn will send that language on the incidental reading to Ms. Bar Sparling, which she's already passed out. Right. And I believe that. Right right okay, Mr. Barn and Mr. Kirk, are you going to be dealing with. Uh, what did we just finish discussing? What you, you two were going to be dealing with, or was Mr. Definition. Yeah, Mr. Varn is okay. He's, he, is, he alone was going to draft some language, which I assume everyone on the commission would receive. Well, as he drafts it up, would hey, Mr. Varn, are you there still? Yes, I am. I, 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 uh, yes, the uh, language I'm tracking, and then the language of the previous discussion on uh, on the uh, incidental reading are the two things I'm working on. 
before you get the tracking language out to to the full committee, shoot it by Representative Kurt so he can look at it and make sure yes, that I you, will. I'll need it help. you two have the loose ends tied up. I think that's just great. And uh, Kurt, I was going to check with the AG's office on the rental motion. Correct. As far as uh, probable cause and yep. warrants and all that kind of stuff. Yes, ma'am. The, the one piece we did not address today that was on the agenda yes. was the use of RFID or RID devices in identity documents, state-issued identity documents? Well, I thought I'd like to devote a day to really discussing that because not only state identity documents, but I'd like to go beyond that and talk about uh, state libraries and things like that and whether or not they should be allowed or what kind of notification. I'd like to really deal with the whole state issue entirely, if you'd like. I was just trying to get a sense of, is that something we're postponing, we think we'll tackle it next time? It looks like we've got a pretty full plate with everybody reporting back on it. I'd really like to wrap this stuff up. Kirk, do you have an anxiety about well, that? Well, I, I think that we're really talking about a number of things in each of these sections. For example, the language that Mr. Varn is going to produce on tracking, um, I think that covers not just consumer products, but everything. It's not clear to me that that, I mean, that, for example, right. would cover the American Express card to the extent it's got a chip in it, and they use it not for the purpose for which the consumer bought it, to make his purchases, but to track him in between his visit to a very major um, uh, American retailer and a very minor American retailer. Correct. But I'd like to, the, the whole thing from licensing all the way through to libraries, restriction on state use. And I consider that all the same. You raised some questions when we talked about libraries. It doesn't look like that's going to make it in this legislative session, though. Which? Based on the speed at which we're on which? The, the state restriction, that, that this commission will not have a recommendation for the legislature on in this legislative period on state use of RFID. Or, I don't know. Or RFID we very well may, we very well may not. I don't know that we'll be able to, we wouldn't be, normally we wouldn't have been able to, to put all this stuff in the statute this year anyway. Because right. remember, the commission's life extends into what this fall is coming up. Right. Yes, Representative Thank you. I, I plan to ask the Commerce Committee to include the state-specific language in, in the House version fine. in the hopes that this group will get together and by the time the Senate has the bill, have some sort of consensus which could then um, augment or compete with what the House does. And I have no objection to that. I think that's a great idea. If it satisfies our needs, then we're fine. If it doesn't satisfy our needs, then it won't be a committee decision. It's just that simple. Any other questions? 10 o'clock on the uh, 7th. All right. Just rest up. I'll turn. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Barnes. Sure. All right. I'm going to mm -hmm. sign off. Bye now. Bye. Yeah, that's that's, 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 that's,